Good evening. It's time for us to begin our evening worship. We're thankful for everyone being back this evening. Uh, before we get started, uh, there was one announcement that was be, uh, failed to mention this morning, but uh, Brother Felix Bergel is having cataract surgery uh, this week and requests our prayers. So let's continue to uh, keep him and Odessa in our prayers as they're struggling with their health. Uh, we'll sing number 350. Number 350, we'll sing the first and last verse. As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a
Heavenly Father, we pray that the selection of our new elders, that they'll work with our old ones, and everything will be good for the church, the betterment of the new. Heavenly Father, we pray for the sick, especially of our community. They'll still be back there by one place in life. <clears throat> pray that the speaker of our will have a happy recollection of his lesson, present it to us in a way that will be much fun. Watch over us and care for us all through this week, all through the future life. If you are our sins, we pray. Bye. Song for the lesson will be number 15 in the Southern Book. Number 15, exalted. <coughs> if you like, we can stand as we sing the song. No. Some that have not been with us in a while, they're here. We appreciate your being able to be with us. And it's just uh, been a wonderful day as we've uh, worshiped God earlier this morning and look forward to our service this evening. I'd like for us this evening to think about. Turn it, press the wrong button. There we go. We'll think about growing the church uh, from the book of Ephesians. And most of this lesson, although not all of it, will come from uh, the book of Ephesians in chapter 4. So if you want to turn your Bible there, that's fine. And uh, most of the scriptures will be on the overhead. So uh, if you don't turn it, they will be there for you to see. But I'd like for us to think about growing the church. In Ephesians 4, beginning of verse 14, Paul says, As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. And so as we think about the church growing here, we see that we are to grow up in Christ. He is the head of the church. Verse 16 says, from whom the whole body, that is the church, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And so as we think about the church growing and we think about how can we grow as a church, and certainly since we've been through all of the things that we've been through in the last uh, two and a half years, we've seen uh, our numbers go down, we've seen a number of things happen, and uh, some of our members have passed away over the last two years or so. And, and as we see this and, and we think about the church and we think about how we're we going to grow and 
what do we want to do to make things better than what they are now? I think one of the things we have to understand is that the church can only grow as we grow individually. And, and if there's real solid growth within the church, it is because those who make up that church are growing individually. He said there in verse 16, from whom the whole body being fit and held together by that which every joint supplies. And so each of us has to supply our part if we're going to grow as, as a church. And he says each of us supplies our part to the proper working of each individual part. And it causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself. And so Paul is saying here that as you grow individually, then the church as a whole can grow. And I think we need to understand that and realize that the responsibility then for the church here at Ephesus to grow is on each one of us individually. And as, as we do our part, as we work together, uh, both individually and as a church, then we can see uh, growth that will take place. And so it is necessary for us, each one, to do our part, and, and I think that begins when we determine within ourselves that we're going to be as godly as we possibly can, that we're going to seek to be like Jesus. We're going to try to just be every part of our life what, what God wants us to be. If you go back and you look at verse 1 of this chapter, he says, Therefore the prisoner, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And so he says we are to to live this godly life we have been called as Christians to serve God and we are to, to try to be like Christ. He says in verse 2, with all humility and gentleness. And, and it's necessary then for us to, to realize that, that I've got to do my part and I've got to be what God wants me to be if, if the church is going to grow as, as we want it to grow. And so he says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. The idea of, of patience and the idea of forbearance means, uh, just in plain, simple, colloquial language, it just means putting up with some things and putting up with some people that's sometimes hard to do. But he says that's what we have to do. And, and all of us have at different times, we have good times and bad times, and and the fact is we all have to be patient with each other because all of us are going to do things sometimes maybe we shouldn't have or we'll say something we shouldn't have. And, and, and so as we learn to be patient with one another, that goes a long way in helping the church to grow and to be what God wants us to be. Paul explained this over in Philippians chapter 2, and there he's talking about how Jesus did, and he talks about what we are to be like Jesus in, in our humility and so on. And there he says in verses 3 and 4, he says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind let each of you regard one another as more important than himself, not merely looking out for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. One of the things that I have observed in my years of, of preaching, and they have Sortly, sort of lately crept up on me as I look back and it's a lot longer than I like to think about sometimes that I've, I've been preaching. But as I look back and I think about the various places I've been and visited congregations and worked with people in different churches and so on, one of the things that I found out is that more often than not, when you have problems in a local congregation, it's because somebody's being selfish or somebody's being self willed or somebody feels like everything's got to go their way instead of looking out for the interest of others and, and putting others ahead of ourselves. And usually they'll make some kind of doctrinal something as, as a, a front to, to hide behind. But usually if you boil it all down, you figure out what really is happening. It's because somebody's just being selfish about things. And, and so we need to make sure that we don't do that. And if we want the church to grow, then we have to put others ahead of ourselves and and work together as, as a group. In Ephesians 4, in verse 3, he says, Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Being diligent 
In other words, putting forth a lot of effort to make sure that we have this unity that God wants us to have. But he says being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. You see, the unity of the Spirit comes about when we become a Christian because when I become a Christian and Brendan becomes a Christian and Ryan becomes a Christian and Vernon becomes a Christian, then we have a unity in the Spirit. And what he's saying is God has made us one together and we have this unity of the Spirit. And now what he's saying is we need to be diligent to preserve that unity of the Spirit. He's not saying go out and make unity. It's there for us as Christians. And so he says we are to preserve the unity of the Spirit. And this unity of the Spirit is, is I just explained, is, is because God has put us all in one and therefore we have this bond of peace. We have this agreement that we're all Christians and we're going to work together and we're going to do what God wants us to do and be what God wants us to be. And as long as we maintain that attitude, then we will get along and we will grow as God's people. You need to understand that there's one body. This body, of course, is the body of Christ. It is those who have been called out. It is those who have been saved. He says there in verse 4, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your call. If you go back to Ephesians chapter 2, there in verses 13 through 16, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, and he's talking there about the Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself, talking about Jesus, for he himself who made is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. And so what he's saying is that at one time you had the Jews and you had the Gentiles and they hated each other. And the Jews felt like they had the only track to God and the Gentiles just really detested that about the Jews. And so he says now in Christ the Jews and the Gentiles can all be one in Jesus Christ. And he said Jesus did that by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And so here he's saying not specifically about the church at Ephesus that he's writing this letter to, but he's talking about the church in a more universal sense. That is, all of those who have been saved. And he says what God has done is he has taken all of these diverse people from many different backgrounds, from many different nationalities, from many different whatever, and he says now all of them have been made one in Jesus Christ. And he says the way that this happens is that we are baptized into Christ. But when we are baptized into Christ, then God adds us to the body of Christ. And so we're not baptized into the church, we're baptized into Christ Jesus. And then God adds us to the church. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter pre preached that first sermon on the day of Pentecost, and it talks about how many of them were saved, and it talks about... How many of them then, they were having uh, interaction every day and, and, and so on. And, and then in verse 47 of Acts chapter 2, it says, They were praising God and having favor with the people, and the Lord was adding to their number. And if you have a King James there, it says, The Lord was adding to the church. The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So he's saying that this one body of Christ is all of those people who have been saved. It doesn't matter if it's this year or last year. It doesn't matter if it's 1,000 years ago or if it's 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now. It doesn't matter what nation they live in. It doesn't matter what kind of country they come from or what kind of ethnic background. But we're all one in Christ Jesus, and this is that unity of the Spirit. And he says, within a local congregation, make sure that you are being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so then we're added to 
to the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 4, in verses 4 and 5, it says there's one body and one spirit, just as you also were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And in Romans 6, in verse 3, he says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? And so in all of these passages, we see that we are baptized into Christ. We're baptized into his body to be a part of him. In Galatians 2 and verse 20, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. And then when he writes to Titus, he explains a little more about this process of being saved in Titus chapter 3 and there in verses 4 through 7. He says, When the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that what he's talking about here when he says by the washing of regeneration, he's talking about when we are baptized into Christ. Our sins are washed away. Remember Ananias told Saul, Saul of Tarsus, he says, what are you waiting on? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so we are washed when we're baptized into Christ. And then we are renewed within by the Holy Spirit. And through the work of the Holy Spirit, we become a new person in Jesus Christ. And so Paul, in writing to the Romans in Romans chapter 6, a little after what I referred to a while ago, he talks about the fact that when we're buried with Christ, we're raised to walk in newness of life. We become a new person in Jesus Christ. And so see, he says, by the washing of regeneration, renewing, by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so as a child of God, my sins have been washed away. I have the Spirit of God to live in me and to help me and to guide me, to change me into that new person. So that over a period of time, the fruit of the Spirit begins to flourish in my life. And I become more and more like what God wants me to be. And, and that goes back to verse 1 of Ephesians 4, when he says that we're walking in a manner worthy of his calling. And that's what happens as we mature spiritually, as we grow spiritually. And so as we grow spiritually, then the church as a group will grow spiritually as well. Paul says there is one God. He says there's one Lord. It's Jesus Christ. God is referred to here as, as God the Father. And then there's one Lord, that's Jesus Christ, and there's one Spirit, and that's his referring to the Holy Spirit. He says there's one faith, and I believe here this one faith is not the body of system or system of teaching that there is, but I believe what he's saying here is there is one genuine commitment and faith and trust in God if we're going to be saved. And then he says there's one baptism. And we're baptized into Christ. And then as a result of that, there is the one body, which is made up of all of those who have been saved by God through Jesus Christ. In verses 4 through 6, he says there, there's one body and one spirit, just as you also were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And so we see in almost reverse order from the way I listed them in this passage, the same thing said that we just looked at. But as the children of God and, and here as the children of God here at Ephesus, we must grow and we must work in love. And it's necessary that we genuinely love each other and, and, and show that love in the way we act toward each other and the way we conduct ourselves as a part of this church. In verse 16, he says, 
from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And so it's necessary then that we, we live a life of love. It's interesting just if you go on to the very next chapter, he begins that chapter, chapter 5, by saying, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us in offering sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And so he said, if we're going to be like God, then we've got to love. If we're going to be like Jesus Christ, we've got to demonstrate love in our lives. And it's so important. The church will never grow if, if we don't have that love. If we don't have the unity of the Spirit, if we don't seek to diligently to preserve the, the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, the church will never grow. Not only are we to work and grow in love, we have to be faithful to His will. We have to be faithful to His word. We have to do it the way God says do it. One of the interesting things as a preacher I've seen over the years is all the different ideas for church growth. And, and I get emails occasionally or I've gotten brochures in the mail or other things with all these ideas for church growth. And and one of the problems with them, with many of these is that they really have little or nothing to do with spiritual growth. It's just simply ways to increase the numbers of people that are coming. And while there may be some value in that, that's not really our goal so much as it is to help people to grow closer to God and to be what God wants them to be and to find that one lost soul that's willing to turn their life over to Jesus Christ. We have to be faithful to his word. We have to do it the way God says do it. He says in verse 14 and 15, As a result, we're no longer to be children. Tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. Satan is the father of lies. He is the master of deception. And from the very beginning of mankind, he deceived Eve, and he has been deceiving people ever since. And he's going to do everything he can to deceive you and me so that we begin to stray from the truth and, and be tossed about here and there like a, a small boat on the way. He says, but rather instead of doing that, he says, but speaking the truth in love were to grow up in all aspects in the end who is the head even Christ. And so it is necessary for us to study God's word and to know what God wants us to be and to, to learn how to live to be like Jesus Christ. But one of the things that happens sometimes is that people begin to study God's word and then they begin to look at themselves and they say, boy, I really know what that Bible says. And I've heard people talking about they, their knowledge of the Scripture compared to somebody else and, and how wonderful it was that they knew so much more than everybody else. And the fact is, it's not about intellectual knowledge. I don't know if you ever thought about it or not, but that baby in Christ that has had their sins forgiven is just as forgiven as that person who has been a Christian for 40 years and been studying the Scripture all of the time. And the only way we're saved is by having our sins forgiven. So that person is just as well off as far as God is concerned as this one who has been studying for a long time. Now, as a Christian, we are to grow and we are to mature and we are to learn more as time goes by. But Paul says to the Corinthians that knowledge puffs up. It's easy for us to... Once we learn a little bit about the Bible, we begin to think, well, boy, I know more than they do. I'm really proud of all the wonderful things I've learned over the years. And what that does is it destroys the local church. In fact, when he says knowledge puffs up, it's written in the context of the Corinthian church dealing with some of the problems that they had specifically with spiritual gifts. 
And his answer to those problems is found in 1 Corinthians 13 in a passage that we so often use at wedding ceremonies and it has really absolutely nothing to do directly with a marriage. He's talking about a local congregation when he talks about love and all the wonderful aspects of love in 1 Corinthians 13. And so the answer to it is to not be puffed up, not be proud, but rather to genuinely love one another. And so it's not about how much I know, it's about learning to be like Jesus in every part of my life. He says in verse 13 of Ephesians 4, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, that is, we've grown spiritually to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. You know what he's saying there? He says, my goal is to be spiritually just like Jesus. I doubt that I'll ever make that in this life. But that doesn't keep it from being my goal. It doesn't keep me from trying to, to reach that goal in, in every part of my life. And he says in verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects in him who is the head, even Christ. And so we are to grow spiritually, and as we grow spiritually and we reach out to those that are lost around us and, and we bring them to Jesus Christ, then the church will grow and it will be a solid growth. And that's what we need to do here at Ephesus. For the church to grow, we have to grow individually. And that means that each one of us has to do our job, whatever that job is. Now the truth is, we all have different abilities, and we all have different gifts from God, and therefore, we each one have different responsibilities. God does not expect the same thing from you that He expects from me, or that He expects from Brendan, or that He expects from somebody else. But God does expect us to use what He has given us to do the job that he has given us to do. And so he says in verses 11 through 16 that he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we're no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him, who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And that just means that you and I have to do our part, whatever that part is. You know, if you're a Christian tonight, I feel sure that if I were to ask you that you could tell me what you did in order to become a Christian. And if you can tell me what you did to become a Christian and why you did that, then the fact is you could tell somebody else what they need to do to become a Christian and why they need to do that. And so each of us can, can do some part in helping the church to grow. And it may be a neighbor next door. It may be our children. It may be some friend that we have that lives down the street or it may be somebody that we associate with or just some random person we run into that we can strike up a conversation and, and share the gospel with. But it's not just reaching out and sharing the gospel with people that makes the church grow. It's when we demonstrate our love for each other and we show that in so many different ways and we show it when we come together and we encourage each other in our worship services. We show it when we have somebody that is going through some problem and, 
and we go and we pray with them or maybe we send them a card or maybe we call them on the telephone or, or whatever the case may be. Or maybe we fix some food for them or go clean their house or whatever it is. And, and each of us has the ability to do something in our service to God so that we can actually help each other grow and help each other be faithful and help each other serve the Lord. And so each of us has our own responsibility and we need to be willing to do what God wants us to do. The question this evening is, are you in Christ? Are you a part of the body of Christ? If not, you need to come to Jesus tonight and confess your faith in Him as the Son of God, as your Lord, as your Savior. And to put on Christ in baptism and be renewed by the Holy Spirit. And then with your sins forgiven, you begin to seek to be like Jesus in everything and every way that you possibly can. If you're here this evening, your subject is invitation. We invite you to come as we stand.
Is there anyone here that would like to take of the Lord's Supper at this time? Please raise your hand. Let's give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this wonderful Lord's Day that you've blessed us with. And at this time, that, that this one can partake of the, the Lord's Supper, and we pray your blessings on this bread, which represents that body of Christ that was sacrificed on the cross. Be with this one it, that you may partake of it in a way and manner pleasing itself in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Let's continue our prayer. Like manner, Father, we thank you for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which to your children is the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cruel cross of Calvary for our sins. Be with this one as she partakes that she may do so in a way and a manner as pleasing itself in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Again, as Brother Robert said, it's been a beautiful day to worship the Lord, and we pray that all of us have, have been edified uh, from today's worship, and we're so thankful that we were able to appoint new elders and deacons, and we hope we'll uh, pray for them and, and their families as they embark on this new journey. Uh, we'll sing number 708, the first and last verse of this song, as our closing song, and then after which Brother Bob will lead us in our closing prayer. Let's all stand as we sing. Walking in sunlight. 